Hi friends, welcome to PSC Collegiate English. Today, let us look at the poem Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens, 1879-1955 Stevens is one of America's most respected 20th century poet. He is a master stylist employing an extraordinary vocabulary. Stevens is a philosopher of aesthetics, vigorously employing the notion of poetry as the supreme fusion of the creative imagination and objective reality. He is often considered a difficult poet because of technical and thematic complexity. Wallace Stevens is an eminent abstractionist and provocative thinker. Some of his works are he has mostly written poems, so some of the poetry collections are mentioned below. Peter Quinn's At the Clavier, The Whole of Harmonium, Le Monocle, Daemon Uncle, Domination of Black, The Emperor of Ice Cream, Sea Surface Full of Clouds, Collected Poems 1954. For this particular collection of poems, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. Some of his plays are Three Travelers Watch a Sunrise, Carlos Among the Candles, and his prose piece is The Necessary Angel. Wallace Stevens has been awarded Bollinger Prize for Poetry in the year 1949, National Book Award for Poetry in the year 1951, Frost Medal 1951, and Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in the year 1955. Coming to the poem as such, uh, we would uh, read the poem and analyze it by stanza by stanza. Complacencies of the pregnoyer and late coffee and oranges in a sunny chair and the green freedom of a cockato upon a rug mingled to dissipate the holy hush of ancient sacrifice. She dreams a little and she feels the dark encroachment of that old catastrophe as a calm dark darkens among water lights. The pungent oranges and bright green wings seem things in some procession of the dead. Winding across wide water without sound, the day is like wide water without sound, stilled for the passing of her dreaming feet over the seas to silent Palestine, dominion of the blood and sepulchre. Coming to the analysis of the first answer, the day described is a Sabbath day, and a woman is dressed in light morning gown, which is also known as pegnoir, and she is enjoying coffee and oranges in the company of a cocato, which is a bird. The woman begins to doze off into dream, and even in her lapsed condition, she has interest in religion. There is a subtle allusion to Christ walking on water in the latter part of the first stanza as she dreams her mind going off to Palestine, the holy land, where Christ was crucified and buried in a tomb. The things depicted in the language are either of natural or religious tomb. Coming to the second stanza, why should she give her bounty to the dead? What is divinity if it can come only in silent shadows and in dreams? Shall she not find in comforts of the sun, in pungent fruit and green, fruit and bright green wings or else, in any balm or beauty of the earth, things to be cherished like thought of heaven? Divinity must live within herself, passions of rain or moods in pale falling snow, grievings in loneliness or unsubdued, elation when the forest blooms, gusty emotions on wet roads on autumn nights, all pleasures and all pains, remembering the bow of summer and the winter branch. These are the measures destined for her soul. Coming to the analysis as such, the fundamental questions start to arise within her. The word bounty means generosity. The old religion is demanding her life, but why should she sacrifice that for a shady sense of divinity? Now this is the confusion that is uh, in the mind of the woman. The poem goes as if the woman is talking to herself or analyzing herself. Nature elicits the deepest feeling in human beings. Why not become one with the natural world and accept the highs and lows of emotional life? The woman's conscience suggests to her 
that divinity lies within her own psyche. The last line suggests that all pleasures and pains are going to affect her soul. Soul is the collective emotional nature of who we are as humans. Coming to the third stanza, Joe in the clouds had his inhuman birth. No mother suckled him, no sweet land gave large mannered motions to his mythy mind. He moved among us as a muttering king, magnificent, would move among his hinds until our blood commingling virginal with heaven brought such requital to desire the very hinds discerned it in a star. Shall our blood fail or shall it come to be the blood of paradise and shall the earth seem all of paradise that we shall know? The sky will be much friendlier than then than now, a part of labor and a part of pain and next in glory to enduring love, not this dividing and indifferent blue. This stanza outlines a history of religious God, beginning with Joe, who is a Roman god of sky. He is also known as Jupiter. Jupiter controls the thunder and lightning. It is believed so. Joe had no human birth unlike Jesus, who was born to a virgin in a society ruled by invading Romans. The speaker asks three vital questions concerning the blood, which is the human life force and its future state of being. The speaker goes on to imply that his new paradise will enable humankind to enjoy a shared world as the divine idea will change and gods will no longer live separately there. So in the mind, the speaker imagines a world where God exists amidst humans. That means the humans will not have to look forward to heaven or to gods. Gods will exist with us. She says, I am content when awakened birds before they fly test the reality of misty fields by their sweet questionings. But... When the birds are gone and their warm fields return no more, where then is paradise? There is not any haunt of prophecy nor any old chimera of the grave, neither the golden underground nor isle, melodious where spirit gathered them home, nor visionary south nor cloudy palm, remote on heaven's hill that have endured as April's green endures or will endure like her remembrance of awakened words, or her desire for June and evening tipped by the consummation of the swallow's wings. The fourth stanza explains, as if listening to the speaker's argument, the woman asks a question. She describes how happy she is listening to birds in a field, but once they are gone, she questions whether observation is enough to restore the ideal. Can human senses experiencing nature even replace or compensate for disappearing concepts of paradise? The speaker insists that her remembered experiences will prevail over any that are supernatural. Coming to the fifth stanza, she says, But in contentment I still feel the need of some imperishable bliss. Death is the mother of beauty, hence from her alone shall come fulfillment to our dreams. And our desires, although she strews the leaves of sure obliteration on our paths, the path sick sorrow took that many paths where a triumph rang its brassy praise or love. The dialogue continues with the woman expressing the need for an immortal reward in heaven. To live forever is longing hard to nullify. The speaker describes the nature cycles of change that exist within life. Death is the mother of beauty. This is the basic truth of nature. Also, this particular line, death is the mother of beauty, is the crux of this poem. The seed lives, the seed dies and from it springs new growth and new life. 
from willow trees to plums and pears and human change is the beauty and it refreshes all coming to the sixth stanza is there no change of death in paradise does ripe fruit never fall or do the boughs hang always heavy in that perfect sky unchanging yet so like our perishing earth with rivers like our own that seek for seas they never find the same receding shores that never touch with inarticulate pang coming to the analysis as such the fundamental questions start to arise within her the word bounty means generosity the old religion is demanding her life but why should she sacrifice that for a shady sense of divinity now this is the confusion that is uh, in the mind of the woman the poem goes as if the woman is talking to herself or analyzing herself this stanza asks if change occurs in paradise does death occur in paradise the speaker suggests that there is stasis that human supernatural brings stagnation for human beings it is said with the idea that beauty comes from the acceptance of final death there is some mystery retained in this natural flux because there are imperfections which makes us wonder coming to the seventh stanza supple and turbulent a ring of men shall chant in an orgy on a summer morn their boisterous devotion to the sun not as a god but as god might be naked among them like a savage source their chant shall be a chant of paradise out of their blood returning to the sky and in their chant shall enter voice by voice the windy lake wherein their lord delights the trees like seraphim and echoing hills that choir among themselves long afterward they shall know well the heavenly fellowship of men that perish and of summer morn and whence they come and whither they shall go the dew upon their feet shall manifest she says i am content when awakened birds before they fly test the reality of misty fields by their sweet questionings but when the birds are gone and their warm fields return no more where then is paradise coming to the eighth stanza she hears upon the water without sound a voice that cries the tomb in palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering it is the grave of jesus where he lay we live in an old chaos of the sun or old dependency of day and night or island solitude unsponsored free of the of that wide water inescapable dear walk upon our mountains and the quail whistle about us their spontaneous cries sweet berries ripen in the wilderness and in the isolation of the sky at evening casual flocks of pigeons make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings coming to the explanation of the eighth stanza the woman hears a voice a biblical voice perhaps like the voice of john the baptist who cried out in the wilderness make straight way of the lord and god the speaker concludes we are still influenced by the old religion and their gods they bring chaos they isolate we cannot escape it yet 
The woman perhaps remains torn between a need for pleasurable and need to know that the imperishable bliss is still unattainable. The themes mentioned in the poems are belief in supernatural versus belief in reality, the idea of paradise versus earthly pleasure. She asks if paradise is needed or can human beings be content with nature and its surroundings. Yet another theme is fading away of established religion. There is also a hint of establishment of a new belief system. There is a conflict between death, immortality and beauty. The themes are, some of the themes are happiness, choices that human beings have to make, religion, nature and human beauty. Coming to the appreciation of the poem, lots of figures of speech are used in this poem. So first, uh, let us see what is alliteration. The, the words like uh, holy hush, winding across wide water, balm or beauty, path or pain, all are examples of alliteration. Alliteration is the figure of speech where consonant sound is repeated. In holy hush, ha sound is repeated. Winding across wide water, wa sound is repeated. Balm or beauty, ba sound is repeated. Part or pain, pa sound is repeated. Coming to the next figure of speech, that is assonance. Assonance is when two or more words in close alliance have the same sounding vowel. So we have green, freedom, here e sound is repeated. We have calm, darkness, here a sound is repeated. Yet another figure of speech is enjambment. Enjambment is when lines run into the next with no punctuation but maintaining sense. Example, and the green freedom of a cacato upon a rug mingled to dissipate the holy hush of ancient sacrifice. The entire idea is conveyed through three lines without any punctuation. Some of the symbols used in this poem are the sun, the sky, birds like cocato. Uh, the bird cocato uh, is referred to the funeral gift that ancient people uh, bring to a procession while visiting an important tomb. Also, the birds like quail and pigeon are also mentioned. Fruits like oranges, pears and plums and berries are also mentioned in the poem. Water is a symbol. Morning and evening uh, symbolizes uh, life as well as death. Blood. Blood has uh, two connotations. In Christian belief, it means the sacrifice of Christ. Whereas in pagan belief, it simply refers to uh, human energy or the human life force. There is also symbol of death. Uh, the important line uh, that is i quote death is the mother of beauty forms the crux of this poem sunday morning is an enigmatic poem that is part metaphysical part romantic it also explores the idea of the origin and end of eras of human belief the poem has eight stanzas of 15 lines each therefore the total lines are 120 it um, the main conflict in the poem is a minor crisis which is loss of faith. The woman has lost faith in the old religion. That is why she is not visiting the Sunday service uh, at church. She is sitting at home enjoying coffee uh, along with the... She is also enjoying the view of nature. And she is in a confusion whether uh, to be satisfied uh, by the natural surroundings and to live in the present or rather think about religion, think about divine life, think about uh, uh, the paradise, which, which would be the gift of uh, afterlife. And she also thinks if gods coexist along with human beings, that would be a better surrounding. She also thinks if uh, change happens only human world, if everything is stagnant in paradise, what is the point or what is the use of going to paradise? So all such crisis uh, forms the idea of this poem. So Stevens himself says, I quote, This is not essentially a woman's meditation on religion and the meaning of life. It is everybody's meditation. The poem is simply an expression of paganism. That is what Wallace Stevens himself said about this poem. Thank you so much.